Good evening, everyone. Good evening. As we take our seats, it's nice to see all of you here. I know people are still looking for some seats. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Hunter O'Haney, and the director of the College Art Association. Uh, thank you. We want to welcome everyone to CAA's 107th Annual Conference. And on behalf of the Board of Directors, the staff, the membership of over 10,000 professionals in the field, we're happy to see everybody here in New York. We're also very pleased to have a special guest here this evening to greet everyone on behalf of the City of New York. New York City Department of Cultural Affairs Commissioner Tom Finkelpearl oversees city funding for nonprofit arts organizations and leads the effort to promote cultural diversity and arts programs citywide. Commissioner Finkelpearl has been instrumental in increasing access to res and resources for artists and arts organizations and has overseen efforts to increase arts education in our public schools. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Commissioner Tom Finkelpearl. Uh, so I will cite a statistic. There are 444 more full-time arts teachers in our public school system than they were when this mayor took office. 444, yeah. So, and, but I will correct Hunter and say I actually had very little to do with that. That's DOE. Um, but we're encouraging them and cheering them on. So we are the Cultural Affairs Office. We are the landlord at cultural institutions you might have heard of, like the Metropolitan Museum, Museum of Natural History, Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, Queens Museum, Brooklyn Museum, Bronx Museum, etc. We've been investing in arts and culture for the last 149 years in a very in-depth way. This year we have the largest cultural budget any city in America has ever had, $200 million of expense and $200 million of capital, $400 million of your, if you live in New York City, it's your money, your taxpayer money. Um, so I think that that might be one of the reasons that CAA comes here every other year, more or less, is there are decent museums and galleries, et cetera, to see. And I know that you have a really good uh, slate of museums that are, or cultural institutions that are welcoming you, so I would just like to encourage you to also get outside of Manhattan and see some of those great places. So we have a diversity, equity, inclusion requirement now that uh, all grantees have to talk about that in their applications. And all the organizations on our property, which is 33 major cultural institutions, will develop diversity, equity, inclusion plans with goals, and the drafts are due on Friday. So, and the other thing about that I want to say uh, is that these, if they don't develop these in a way that's satisfactory to the city, we will cut their budgets by up to 10%. So I think it is serious. I want to just say congratulations to CAA. Welcome to New York City on behalf of Mayor de Blasio. And what an incredible group of honorees. I mean, really, you have hit the nail on the head in terms of incredible excellence and, and, and intellectual depth and also diversity and, and gender diversity and, and everything else. So I just wanted to welcome everybody to New York City. I love coming to CAA. My wife is a PhD in art history. I used to come to this quite often. Um, so welcome to New York City on behalf of the mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. At the outset, oh, is your wife's memberships up to date? Just, just doing my job. Um, okay, at the outset, I want to thank Tiffany Dugan, Paul Skiff, and the entire staff of the CAA office. In addition, I want to thank Elizabeth Schlatter, the CAA's outgoing vice president for the annual conference, Charlene Villa Senior Black, the annual conference chair, and the entire annual conference committee, including everyone who spent countless hours reading and supporting the applications that all of you submitted. I also want to thank CAA member Ryan Seslow for creating the imaginary gifts on art history we saw when you entered the room. The 107th Annual Conference is going to be a great event. Take a look at your program, either in paper or on the app. You'll see that we've organized more than 325 90-minute sessions. There are more than 1,700 CAA members participating in the conference this year, the largest ever in our century-long history. 
There are more than two dozen s sessions on the 16th century alone. For those interested in contemporary art, you'll find scores of sessions ranging from Africa, technology, and visual culture, or art and ecologies of data. In addition, there'll be presentations and awards presented to some of the most significant leaders and thinkers in the art world. Those include, but are no way limited to, Joyce J. Scott, Elizabeth Hale Boone, Howard Dina Pendel, Ursula von Reidensvard, and Julie Maratou. And as you walk the halls of the Hilton this week, you no doubt will see the faces and have conversations with rising leaders and thinkers in the field. These are the many scholars, artists, and educators making their own mark. For this year's conference, as the commissioner mentioned, we, want, we worked hard to make sure that you would get out of the Hilton as well and get into the rest of, of New York. Be sure to visit the other boroughs of the city of New York, but through partnerships that we've had here in Manhattan, we've arranged for you to visit many of the museums and get galleries. You'll get to see the study rooms of the Morgan Library and Museum, the Frick Collection, the Jewish Museum, the Whitney, the Dia Art Foundation, the Rubin Museum of Art, the New York Public Library, the Neue Gallery, and many others. If you've not purchased tickets for any of these events, please stop by the registration area as there are still, still some tickets available. Without question, this is the opportunity for artists, art historians, and museum professionals to connect. At the conference, we hope you catch up on personal and professional lives, learn something new, and most importantly, have fun. Please give a hug to someone you just met or someone you haven't seen in years. Now a few housekeeping matters. First, we have Wi-Fi access throughout the Hilton. We've posted the login instructions in the registration area. We also want you to be sure to download the annual conference app. The app is a great way to see everything that's going on. It's free and it will have the most up-to-date information. If you have any questions about using the app, please feel free to stop one of the CAA uh, staff members or one of the helpers and they will help you do it. And to download it, you simply have to go to your Android or Apple App Store. We also want all the CAA members to vote for members of the Board of Directors. All you need is your CAA membership number, which you'll find on the front of your badge. We ask everyone to vote this year as we have six great candidates, as well as, as the opportunity to write in candidates as well. The only way we will strengthen the organization is by building a strong board. It's our organization, and we need to direct its future. You will need to get your vote in by 6 p.m. tomorrow evening, and the results will be announced at the annual business meeting at 2 p.m. on Friday. Also, CAA's board has worked hard over the past two years to recommend changes to our bylaws to better organize the association. Take a moment to look at these changes, and we hope you support them. We also want you to stop by the Cultural and Academic Network Hall in America's Hall 2 here at the Hilton. At the Cultural and Academic Network Hall, more than 30 schools and cultural organizations will exhibit information about their programs. In addition, for the second year, the Idea Exchange will be in the Network Hall. At the Idea Exchange, you can drop in and talk about a variety of topics, ranging from advising graduate students to arts advocacy on college campuses. You will also find our professional development workshops in the Cultural and Academic Network Hall. This year, thanks to the support of the Emily Hall Tremaine Foundation, we are offering 30 professional development workshops that are free and open to the public. We were very happy to see how quickly they filled during the online registration period. These workshops focus on topics like how to get published, how to retool your, your syllabus, or how to devise pedagogical approaches in the time of Me Too. The hall will also be a place for interviewing candidates. We have definitely heard from some candidates that they would prefer not to be interviewed in private hotel rooms. So we've made plenty of interview rooms available. If you plan on interviewing candidates, please stop by the hall to book an interview room if you've not done so already. One of the most lively parts of the conference each year is the Book and Trade Fair, and this year is no exception. The Book and Trade Fair aisles will be lined with the latest books and products from publishers, art materials manufacturers, and education companies. We encourage you to take your time in the Book and Trade, for and discover, uh, trade Fair and discover what's new. You also will be able to have a professional portrait made for your next book jacket. 
We also welcome our affiliated societies. We have 77 affiliated societies and six more are ready to be admitted at the board meetings later this week. These groups represent more than 140,000 colleagues in the field and they're responsible for more than 10% of the sessions at the conference. These societies bring a diversity of voices and perspectives that enrich all of us at CAA. We're always looking to grow this program, and if you are a member of a visual arts organization that is not affiliated with us, please let me know and we can start them on the application process. We also want you to say hi to members of our new ambassador program, visual arts and art history students recruiting new CAA members on college campuses, both in New York and Chicago. If you're interested in learning more about the ambassador program, again, we'll be happy to fill you in. Beginning this year, we also have childcare available at the conference. When Linda Nochlin was on the board in the 1970s, she introduced a resolution that said that childcare was to be provided at every conference. It's taken the organization a few years to get this together, but hopefully it's here to stay. Finally, if you meet a member of CAA's staff, I hope you'll say hello and thank them for their service. Collectively, the CAA staff has more than 125 years of experience in planning the annual conference, overseeing the publication of journals, organizing professional committees, and executing all of our other programs which help you and your professional lives. To them, we owe a great debt of gratitude. Finally, I want to thank all of our sponsors and supporters, Cengage, Rutledge, Taylor & Francis, Hauser & Wirth Publishers, Golden Artist Colors, Prestel, Pearson, Blick Art Materials, Bard Graduate Center, University of California Press, and so many others. It's been wonderful to see all of this great support. I also want to thank our conference partners who help us get the, work out, the word out about the event each year, such as Art Forum, Book Forum, Art in Print, Art in America, Intellectual books, Brooklyn Rail, and Hyperallergic. We also want to thank our other funders and supporters, such as the New York Foundation for the Arts and Mentorly, a new online membership program for the arts. Special thanks go to the Emily Hall Tremaine Foundation for their support of our professional workshops, the Getty Foundation, which supports our international program and who will receive this year's Outstanding Leadership and Philanthropy Award. I also want to thank our other important funders, such as the Samuel H. Kress Foundation, the Terra Foundation for American Art, the Andrew Wyeth Foundation for American Art, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. It is because these organizations believe in the work we do together that our professional association remains so strong. It is now my great pleasure to introduce to you our Vice President for Annual Conference and Programs, Elizabeth Schlatter. Elizabeth, Elizabeth is now ending her three-year stint as Vice President. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Elizabeth Schlatter. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thanks so much for coming. Um, in the program, it mentions that Jim Hoffensberger, CAA's um, president, was actually going to give the remarks this evening, but he's been caught up in the weather snafus that are happening across the country. So um, I am going to read Jim's remarks for us tonight. So when you see him, tell him he gave a great speech uh, later on in the conference. So um, if you see me again, hopefully you'll recognize me. My name, Elizabeth Schleider, is on my um, name tag. I wrote the word hello. And also, I have the yellow uh, ribbon that says board member. Um, my hope is that if you run into me, you'll introduce yourself, if I haven't already done so to you, but that you'll also introduce yourself to anyone who has one of these yellow board member ribbons on their name tags. Um, and you'll tell us about your experience at the conference, as well as your experience with CAA in general. I work at the University of Richmond Museums in Virginia, and while I know a lot about the museum world from being in it throughout my entire career, it wasn't until I got involved at CAA that I understood the responsibilities and responsiveness of a member organization. Being first a regular art conference um, attendant, then a museum committee member, and now a board member, 
has shown me how critical member organizations like CAA are to our livelihoods and to the art world in general. And by being here today, all of you also are assisting CAA in its mission to promote the arts and their understanding through advocacy, intellectual engagement, and commitment to the diversity of practices and practitioners. So now I'm gonna read uh, comments from Jim Hoffensperger, CAA's president. He starts by saying, thank you, Hunter, for reminding us of the size, scope, and outstanding features of the 107th Annual Conference, an impressive convocation of professionals devoted to the advancement of the arts. And thank you on a personal level, Hunter, um, for the intelligence, empathy, energy, and passion you bring to making CAA as inclusive as possible within the obvious and considerable limitations of a big tent organization. It's amazing work that you do. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Thanks to each member of the CAA staff. You move heaven and earth year round to make this event engaging and illuminating as possible. So Jim wanted to read aloud the first names of every staff member at CAA. They are Vanessa, Joanne, Callie, Rial, Tiffany, Mira, Joe, Heather, Janet, Paul, Joan, Daniel, Allison C, Allison W, Doreen, Nick, Joelle, Denise, Scott, Roberta, Wayne, Abdul, and Teresa. Um, so another quick round of applause to the staff. Thanks so much. Thank you. And then lastly, thanks to you, the CAA members, for permitting me, meaning Jim, to share a few observations about the road ahead. At the 2016 convocation, CAA President DeWitt Godfrey, who you'll hear from soon, shared timely and insightful observations about declines in membership for large learned societies, such as CAA and the MLA. He reminded us of the advantages of these organizations, not the least of which is supporting sometimes difficult cross-disciplinary, cross-identity, and cross-cultural conversations that might be less likely within more narrowly defined subgroups and organizations. He made the case for the plurality and heterogeneity of CAA's membership being its greatest asset, that a diverse spectrum of practitioners and scholars gathered at the annual conference is an empowering environment and that CAA's range of publications and programs inspires visual artists, designers, art historians, museum and arts professionals, educators, and the society as a whole. DeWitt was on to something, and the conference changes enacted during Suzanne Blier's recent term as CAA president are also evidence of CAA's desire to be a place that serves the vast range of scholars and practitioners. It's now our charge as an umbrella organization to make the very best of who we can become collectively and individually. A raft of research suggests that healthy organizations, large, medium, and small, prosper when focusing efforts along two key pathways. First, they identify and strengthen their essential core competencies, and second, they systematically investigate and explore their future capacities. Full attention to both matters is essential to extend CAA's distinguished history of advocacy for artists, art historians, scholars, curators, critics, designers, collectors, and educators. First and foremost, CAA remains an eminent learned society with outstanding programs and publications, well positioned to thrive in evolving environments. This is an enduring core strength and our top priority. With respect to future capacities, CAA has taken strides towards fulfilling its potential as a professional association for members across diverse educational, curatorial, scholarly, and creative pursuits. Along these lines, Hunter will be detailing some initiatives designed to support members in their professional lives at the places they work, create, and live. These proposals give me great confidence that CAA will remain strong over the long term. I am further heartened by evidence that CAA of CAA thinking strategically in other ways. Examples include the recent rebranding of as an arts organization that explicitly aspires to advance and support both art and design interests. The evolution of the conference toward quicker pacing of sessions and superb and varied professional development workshops and a member-centered marketplace of ideas. And an upcoming exciting proposal that promises to democratize the conference program review process authorizing more CAA members to shape content in a way that holds the potential to diversify the program while simultaneously empowering the disciplinary experts with greater voice. 
For CIA to advance as a professional association, it is imperative to enhance services for some underserved constituencies, including, but not limited to, the burgeoning ranks of contingent employees upon whom educational and cultural institutions have become increasingly reliant. The large numbers of design and emerging media practitioners graduating from art and design programs and the numerous committees of international scholars, artists, and designers steadily advancing global perspectives. While inroads to connect with and serve these groups are being made, CIA will be tested by the inevitable and all too difficult questions about limited and precious resources. To conclude, CIA is a member organization. We are privileged to have an exceptional core of dedicated colleagues. For more than 100 years, the organization has served, nurtured, supported, and recognized accomplishments and achievements across the fields of visual arts and art history. We can see and feel the forces of change in motion around us, and it is an exhilarating time to be in the business of serving members. Yet, as shifts in economic circumstances for many large organizations suggest, relevance and viability will require flexibility, adaptability, and diligence. It will be CIA's focus along the two aforementioned pathways, one, remaining an eminent learned society, and two, evolving as a relevant professional association that will carry us into the future. It is both a challenge and a privilege to support these efforts, yet with your help and involvement, we will. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. It is without question that you as CAA members represent an engaged and vocal membership. You believe in CAA because collectively, you know that we provide quality programming. You appreciate what happens here at the conference and you have respect for our print and online journals. Our members know that our published standards and guidelines can be carried into a dean's office with confidence and our members trust us to craft smart, well-reasoned advocacy positions on current public, academic, or museum issues. You know that our national and local advocacy is well-respected and pointed in the right direction. Last year, I told you about changes we made to the association. We streamlined the membership levels and launched new benefits that can help aid your professional and personal lives. For a third year in a row, I am pleased to say that we are keeping costs in line by not raising your membership or conference registration fees. We are aware that two-thirds of you are paying for your conference registration out of your own personal budget. Last year, we also launched a new design and logo for CAA and introduced the current tagline, Advancing Art and Design. From the beginning of the rebranding, the idea was to create rotating taglines, swapping one out for a new one every few months to show our dedication to the many professionals in the field of visual arts. We want, you to, be, we want to be sure that we recognize all of the professionals we represent, art historians to designers, curators to scholars, educators to studio artists, regardless of where they are in their career. As Elizabeth mentioned in Jim's comments, the diversity of these professions will make us stronger as an organization. Keep a lookout for these new taglines as they begin, as they will begin to appear in the months and years to come. You'll see them on the CAA website and in our newsletters, in your membership mailings, and maybe even a few mysterious places as we get creative with them. But as a professional association, we know that the number of full-time, tenured positions in America's colleges and universities is shrinking. Department budgets are getting smaller. CAA needs to be the place to connect with colleagues and friends year-round. We need to bridge the generational divide in the field and create a sense of belonging for younger members. We need to understand where the barriers are and find ways to break them down. We need to provide leadership to solve diversity and inclusion issues on college campuses. We need to figure out a way to make sure everyone who has a stake in the visual arts, from practicing artists to teachers of art, art history, design, curatorial studies, museum practices at the college level, 
at every organization, from the loftiest research institution to the most rural community college, feel included and welcomed. Toward this goal, the board of directors took two decisive actions over the past year. First, after much discussion, careful research, and planning, CAA established its guidelines for addressing proposed substantive changes to an art, art history, or design unit, or program at colleges and universities. With the input of Brian Bishop and the Committee on Professional Practices, for the first time, CAA created a blueprint for faculty, administrators, students, and alumni to follow before making final decisions about eliminating or reducing programs in art history and visual arts. These guidelines are designed to preserve the programs at all costs. We have promoted a path of communication and problem solving to avoid the closing of any more art history or visual arts departments. Whether you are a faculty member or administrator, I encourage you to find the guidelines on our website and feel free to reach out if we can help you explore the challenges that your institution faces. We've already heard from many faculty and administrators who have found the guidelines helpful in their work in these efforts. Second, rather than talk about being a professional association which supports its members on a year-round basis, we've devised three new programs which will be implemented this year to help you in your professional lives. First, more than anything, you've said that you are interested in a mentorship program regardless of where you are in your career. CAA's new collaborators program will aim to help members at all stages of their careers navigate their professional lives through practical guidance and support. Mentees will be individuals wishing to develop or change their career path or take on a new project. The mentee will identify a problem, question, or topic that they wish to resolve or learn more about. Mentors will be any visual artist professional, including scholars, museum professionals, designers, administrators. Mentorship relationships will be for six-month periods with monthly contacts. You've also said that you want professional development regional workshops, and they are of great importance to you. We plan to begin hosting half-day workshops in smaller metropolitan areas throughout the country. At the end of the workshop, there will be a small reception for the attendees to mingle and network. Led by CAA members local to the areas identified, these workshops will be especially useful to those interested in CAA who are not able to attend the annual conference, as well as visual arts professionals outside traditional academic positions who may be on a more entrepreneurial path. Finally, one of CAA's greatest strengths is its ability to bring people together. One-on-one -on -one networking opportunities are at the top of the list as to why members stay involved. The new regional gatherings program will be a series of talks and receptions aimed at engaging members in the geographic regions in which they live and work, most which fall outside of major metropolitan areas. The regional gatherings are designed to give members and their guests the opportunities to come together, network, and learn something new. In turn, CAA is able to have an impact in regions of the country where we might not regularly visit. We envision these programs being structured around a central attraction, be it a lightning lecture from a visiting scholar, or a tour of an exhibition at a university art museum or local cultural institution. These events will be un an unstructured opportunity to socialize, learn a little about CAA, and listen to a central presentation. As we think about CAA in the future, we see ourselves doing many things. I see us facilitating professional conversations around cutting edge topics. We are a convener of global connections and we will continue to be. We foster a community of scholars and artists. By helping make scholars and artists successful in their professional lives, we strengthen the society we inhabit. Thank you.
Thank you, Hunter. Nervous again to be back up here. Uh, good evening. My name is Paul Jaskett. I was CAA president from 2008 to 2010. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, they were good years, right? Uh, this year's CAA past presidents will present CAA awards for distinction. With these awards, CAA honors individuals whose unparalleled achievements have made a significant contribution to the artistic profession. By recognizing these outstanding individuals, CAA reaffirms its mission to encourage the highest standards of scholarship, practice, preservation, criticism, and teaching in the visual arts. We will identify each award and this year's recipients. The full citation for each award, I would remind you, along with the names of the jurors who selected them, is printed in the convocation program. And certainly we would like to start by thanking all the jurors for their service. So thank you very much. Uh, let us begin. The Charles Rufus Morey Book Award honors a distinguished book in art history. Named in honor of one of the founding members of CAA and first teachers of art history in the United States, it was established in 1953. This year's Mori Book Award is presented to Zainab Chalek Alexander for a keen aesthetic knowing, aesthetics, epistemology, modern design. The Alfred H. Barr Jr. Award for Museum Scholarship is presented to the author of a distinguished catalog in art history published under the auspices of a museum, library, or collection. Named in honor of the founding director of the Museum of Modern Art and a scholar of early 20th century painting, it was established in 1980. This year's Barr Award is presented to Wendy Kaplan for Design in California and Mexico, 1915 to 1985, found in translation. As Wendy could not be here tonight, uh, Joan Weinstein will accept the award on her behalf. Thank you. The Alfred H. Barr Jr. Award for Smaller Museums, Libraries, Collections, and Exhibitions was presented to Andrew C. Weisselogen and Andalie Badier-Banta for Lines of Inquiry, Learning from Rembrandt's Etchings. The Arthur Kingsley Porter Prize, established in 1957 in memory of a founding member of CAA, is awarded for a distinguished article published in the Art Bulletin. The Porter Prize is presented to Nathan T. Arrington for the article, Touch and Remembrance in Greek Funerary Art. Good evening. My name is Judy Brodsky. I was CAA president from 1994 to 1996. <clears throat> the Frank Jewett Mather Award for Art Criticism is named in honor of the art critic, teacher, and scholar affiliated with Princeton University in order to recognize outstanding contributions to art critical scholarship. This year, the jury unanimously chose two recipients of the Mather Award, Julia Bryan Wilson for Frey, Art and Textile Politics, <laughs> and Rebecca M. Schreiber for the Undocumented Every Day, Migrant Lives and the Politics of Visibility. The Art Journal Award, first presented in 2001, is awarded to the author of the most distinguished contribution published in the Art Journal. This award is presented to Mara Polgovsky Ezkura, for her article, Beyond Evil, Politics, Ethics, and Religion, in Leon Ferrari's illustrated Nunca Mas. <laughs> and
and what a pleasure for me as a pioneer feminist to present the Distinguished Feminist Awards, which honor a visual artist and a scholar who through their practice, scholarship, or advocacy have advanced the cause of equality for women in the arts. The Distinguished Feminist Award for Visual Artist is presented to Senga Nengudi. <laughs> Senga Nengudi could not join us tonight. Marin Hassinger will accept the award on Senga's behalf. The Distinguished Feminist Award for Scholarship is presented to Anna C. Chave. As Anna could not join us tonight, Hunter will accept the award on her behalf. <laughs> uh, my name is DeWitt Godfrey. I was president of CAA from 2014 to 2016. The Distinguished Teaching of Art Award, established in 1972, recognizes an individual who has actively taught art for most of their career, has developed a philosophy of instruction, and has encouraged their students to develop their individual abilities. The award is presented to Suzanne Slavik. The Distinguished Teaching of Art History Award recognizes an individual who has actively taught art history for most of their career. Established in 1977, this award celebrates those who provide inspiration to a range of students, sets rigorous standards, and contributes to the advancement of knowledge. The jury unanimously selected two recipients, Nancy S. Steinhardt, and Edward Sullivan. <laughs> the Artist Award for Distinguished Body of Work, first presented in 1988, recognizes exceptional work through exhibitions, presentations, or performances. The award for a distinguished body of work is presented to Ursula von Riddingsgaard. The Distinguished Artist Award for Lifetime Achievement, dating from 1988, celebrates the lifelong career of an artist. This year, the award is presented to Howardina Pindell. My name is Ann Goodyear, and I was CAA president from 2012 to 2014. The joint CAA AIC Award for Distinction in Scholarship and Conservation Honors, contributions that have enhanced the understanding of art through the application of knowledge and experience in conservation. The jury unanimously selected two recipients, Carl D. Buchborg and Jody Halpin.
the Distinguished Lifetime Achievement Award for Writing on Art, established in 2003, celebrates the career of an author who has demonstrated particular commitment to their work throughout a long career and who has had an important impact on the field. This award, this award is presented to Molly Nesbitt. The Award for Excellence in Diversity, established in 2017, recognizes outstanding efforts in arts programming and scholarship to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion. This year's award goes to the Chicano Studies Research Center. Chan A. Noriega will accept the award on behalf of the center. My name is Nicola Courtright, and I was CAA president from 2006 to 2008. I would like to turn our attention to the recipients of the Professional Development Fellowships in Art History and Visual Art. These awards of $10,000 each recognize outstanding potential in the field. The Professional Development Fellowship in Art History is awarded to C.C. McKee of Northwestern University. <laughs> Honorable mention goes to Julia Vasquez. Julia is not able to join us tonight. Hey, Julian Venice. Hey. <laughs> The Professional Development Fellowship in Visual Art goes to Camilla Labarca Linaweaver from the University of Oklahoma. <laughs> Honorable mention goes to two, Rowan Rene of the University of Michigan, and also to Kira Dominguez Hultgren from California College of the Arts. So let's take a minute to uh, recognize our, extending, our outstanding honorees and their unparalleled contributions to our profession. Thanks a lot. Hello, everyone. I'm Leslie King Hammond. I was president CAA 1996 to 1998. It is my really great honor and pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Trust me, I know you all have been patient. You've been sitting a long time. We've had some wonderful recognition from so many wonderful individuals doing research in the field and yet to do more. <clears throat> I have known Joyce Jane Scott more than half my life. I met Joyce Scott as I left New York City to come to Baltimore, Maryland to work on my doctorate at Johns Hopkins University. She was one of two of the first artists that I met in Baltimore, John Waters, the filmmaker, and Joyce J. Scott. Both of them were highly unusual. <laughs> as we now have recognized since their careers have blossomed and we now recognize who they are in the larger world of our creative geniuses. <clears throat> As I met Joyce, Joyce was on the campus of Johns Hopkins University having wedged herself in between a group of tables where there were many artists who had paid for their tables 
and she was selling these very unusual wearable art effects that she had made. And I began to talk to her because I immediately recognized that this was an extraordinary individual who was just really beginning to scratch the surface. This was in the late 70s. And as we began to develop a friendship from that point, Joyce began to win awards. Joyce was always outstanding, relentless, dogged, look out. She was always looking for the best in herself and the best in every artist in the community in the city of Baltimore. She began winning awards in 1980 with the National Endowment of the Arts. She then went on to win a Tiffany Comfort Award. She then won an Anonymous Was Woman Award. She won the Women's Art Caucus Award. She won Lifetime Achievement Awards from the Renwick Gallery. She won awards for Loot, the jewelry art exhibition at the Museum of Art and Design. She won the Baker Award, and then she won the MacArthur Genius Award, and everybody knew that crazy was really for real. <laughs> In 17, she won the Lifetime Achievement Award from the annual Glass Art Society. Let me remind you that Joyce, Joyce started off with a bead, a bead, a glass bead. In the beginning, when I began to recognize her work and started to write and show in, in exhibitions, people were like, what's up with this craft thing? And I said, we have to get away from the high and the low, all right? We are going into new terrain, and this is where Joyce has taken us. Joyce has had, I would say, and I was doing the stats, I was trying to condense this down into one little paper, and it was just impossible. She's had nearly three dozen residencies. She has had in excess of 200 solo shows. She's been in over 300 group exhibitions. She's had three major retrospects, the Baltimore Museum of Art, the Museum of Art and Design, curated by the Lowry Sims and Patterson Sims, and then Grounds for Sculpture, which was done by Patterson Sims and Lowry Sims. She has had two honorary doctorates, one from the Maryland Institute College of Art, where she got her undergraduate degree, or BFA, and then went on to the Institute Allende, where she got her master's, and then she went on to work a residency and do a fellowship at Haystack. Joyce Scott is not without other amazing talents. And I remember in the 80s, all of a sudden, she began to do performance art, very much similar to another artist here in the room, Howardina Pendel, and another one, Marin Hassinger. And I kept saying, what's up with all of this performance art? And very simply, Joyce said, I have more to say that just cannot be said in beads, in glass, in sculpture. I need to act it out because she has been relentless about the social injustices that have gone on in our society for too long. And her work is literally riddled and mined with these issues. I remember giving a talk in Paris once. There was a big audience like this, and I'm talking about this aspect of Joyce's career. And I said, you know, Joyce is given to doing performance, and Joyce will have a performance at any time, at any place, at any time. And she will work on you or use you as a prop to exercise this abuse, okay, this abuse. So as I'm talking, all of a sudden, I look up from my nose, I see this gentleman in the audience, and he's raised his hand, and I said, well, maybe this is a premature question. And I said, yes, sir, and he says, I've been abused. And then the next thing you know, five, six, seven other hands raised in the audience. Remember, I'm in Paris. I've been abused too. I've been abused, all right? Without further ado, I present to you, with great pleasure, my sister, my nemesis, a genius, finally accorded with a real title from MacArthur, Joyce J. Scott.
I'm not scared of dying and I don't really care if it's peace you're finding. Dying well then, let my time be near. If it's peace you're finding, dying and if dying time is near. Then bundle up my coffin cause it's cold way down there. Troubles are many, they're as deep as a well. I can say there ain't no heaven, but I, I pray there ain't no hell. Say there ain't no heaven, and I'll pray there ain't no hell, but ooh, I never know by living, only by dying will tell. Give me my freedom, I need my freedom. For as long as I be, all I ask of a living is to have no chains on me. All I ask of living is to have no chains on me. Ooh. All I ask of dying is to go naturally. I, I only want to go naturally. And when I die, and when I'm a goy, there'll be one artist born. There'll be one artist born. There'll be one artist born left to carry on, on, oh, Good evening, everyone. Hi, my name is Joyce J. Scott, and I'm so very happy to be here tonight. I'm incredibly honored. The California Association of, what's the name of this thing? The College <laughs> Amalgamated, uh, the Catholic African American, <laughs> the College Art Association. I mean, the guy who wasn't even here took most of my points. And then Leslie came up, isn't Leslie wonderful? She came up and she introduced me and brought up that one small kind of thing when we met where I didn't pay and I had a big Afro wig on and she bought from me. But wait, I cannot go on with not only thanking Lowry Sims for everything, but we have to sing happy birthday because today is her birthday. Happy birthday to you. Come on, everybody. Happy birthday to you. You embarrassed? Happy birthday, dear Lowry. Happy birthday to you. You don't know how long I've waited to see that look on her face. <laughs> so, you know, I was thinking, what am I going to really talk about? All the good topics are gone. You got your wall. You got Megan and Harry and her family. You got Beyonce and Jay-Z at the Louvre. I mean, what's left? Well, you're supposed to talk about stuff you really, and my images should be flowing, guys. Why are my images just like flowing? Cost me a lot of money for these pictures. Where are they? Well, I'm not supposed to click. They're just supposed to go. I went over this already. Do you see what people do? Are you understanding what I'm saying? Oh, you don't know I'm an uncertified multiple personality, so sometimes some people might come out. Thank you, Leslie, very much. You just keep clicking, okay? Boy, so all of these ideas are gone, so I thought, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna do what I really believe in. I'm gonna talk about me, right? <laughs> but why am I gonna thank me? 
I'm really going to talk about me because I want to talk about you. I want to thank you because you're the reason I am who I am. I'm a round-the-way girl from Baltimore, Maryland, living across the street from the projects. My parents were sharecroppers who left the Carolinas, came up to Maryland during that big migration looking for some better opportunities. They both went to one-room schoolhouses when they weren't picking crops, tobacco and cotton. And they had me. And they did everything they could to give me a better life. My parents ate crap so I could have sugar. They wanted my life to shine, and it did. And, and it wasn't just because my mother, Elizabeth Caldwell Talford Scott, is a nationally known uh, textile artist. I mean, people say, Joyce, when did you start as an artist? And I always say in vitro. <laughs> I had the best looking placenta when I came out. <laughs> you know, I started comedy immediately. I said to the doctor, move you in my light. Oh, that's a Henny Youngman joke. You guys are old enough to know that. I went back in twice because I didn't like the first two takes, but boom, boom. Oh, you guys haven't been drinking yet. I got it. My mother was my first teacher at home. But, but how did I develop these abilities? How did I become comfortable with all of my multiple personalities? Stop it, Joyce. Did you hear that? Was I, you know, too much? Uh, you're adults, you knew what that meant, but we don't have to dwell. <laughs> you threw me off my game. Bastard. Did you hear that? I used to walk to my elementary school Coppin Elementary Demonstration School. It was called that because it was a school where the teachers experimented. They concocted, and I just love using that word for obvious reasons, all kinds of weird and, and, and wild ideas about the arts and about sciences and everything on our elementary schools. And that was my beginning of having a real kind of relationship with a teacher as well as a student. And then my junior high school. And in my senior high school, Olin Yoder helped me receive a scholarship to the Maryland Institute of Art. I don't even think it was a college then. It was right, 1866. And I was sure I was going to be a painter. And the first thing I was told was to stop painting for the betterment of myself and the entire human race. And I did. Oh, you know you've said it to people. Don't even sit there and say, yeah. Choice. <laughs> Look, what I did was do what my parents had taught me to do. I come from a long line on both sides of the family of craftsmen, weavers, spinners, clay people. And I just did that artwork. I realized, because I was in the education department, that if I actually became a student in a public school systems, if I taught there, that I would be a 700-pound alcoholic. No, I'm not one now. <laughs> so I decided to do what any self-respecting student did. I went to Mexico. But let me tell you about those four years at MICA. It was very important to me, a 17-year-old African-American kid, round the way girl, who'd always done art but didn't have a systemized way of working who understood the breadth of it, the, the wonder of it, but was not enslaved or squelched by it. I had teachers just like you, who taught me the meaning, the joy, the nourishment of making artwork and sharing it with others. You know, that's one of the best forms of social activism, being one with your students. And I, I know you have it all the time. I know it because when I do crits, they always tell me how great you are. That's pretty amazing, folks, being that important in the lives of young people. And you are. And I thank you because that's why I am who I am today. And you're partially responsible for it. So take it. <laughs> but don't be asking me for money from the MacArthur. You're not that responsible. <laughs> I can say to you, that I know the future is bright because of you. And I just want us all 
to be together and make some real, real plans to stay involved and evolve with our students. I mean, when I travel, I still hear from students, African American students specifically, that they're told not to always use African art as a base because it might not be relevant and it's old. And I say, wait a second. How are they saying that when they make us look at that old ass Roman and Greek stuff over and over again? So I know you're not doing that, so I need you to be progressive. I need you to fight, as you always have, for real equality in schools. Not just for women or people of color, but for our LGBTQ community and for our disabled artists who are having very difficult times in many of these older buildings or buildings that were not planned for them. You keep fighting. I know you have, you've made it possible for them. You made it possible for me. I also go to places and I'll have people in the administration say, you know, Joyce, there's a, a lot of work in working with students, but if you come into the offices, there aren't many people of color. Women are doing well, not incredibly well, but better, but for people of color, LGBT. Q and people with disabilities, they need to be in all manners of this art experience and support it. You've done it in the past, you're designers, you do it, I know you'll keep, and I'm right there with you. I just wanted to thank you because I am this person. This person who went to Murano twice working with glass artists, now you gotta step back. A woman with a big red wig, people looked at me like, oh my God, Angela Davis, what happened? <laughs> Angela, freedom is difficult, isn't it? <laughs> I'm draped in velvet and I've got bags of beads and I'm working with Muranese, Murano glass artists and they just are there for me. What gave me the gall? What gave me the temerity to say I can do it? I got it because you told me I could because you taught me, because you pushed me. And I'm not just talking about the instructors, the educators. I'm talking about the curators who showed my artwork and made me there. I'm talking about the historians who put me right there in context. I'm talking about the other artists who support me. There's nothing better than having the support of other artists because they know what you're going through. So today I thank you. I hope you know just how marvelous you actually are. Your students tell me all the time. Keep going, because there's a Brooks Benton song that makes me think of everybody here. Well, it takes more than some funding to push your ideas through. You keep working, you keep smiling, you keep doing you. And when you get famous, maybe a MacArthur, you can give some money to CAA artist. Uh, you got what it takes. I, I said you, you artist and you. All right, I'm talking about you, all the artists, you. You know you got just what it takes. You know it takes more than knowledge. Hey, you know, you guys work in a college. Hey, it takes more than believing. You gotta keep on achieving. Because you're the brightest lights out here. You design, formulate without fear. Cause artist, you've got what it takes.
Thank you, Joyce, for such an amazing presentation. Well, we hope that you all have a great conference. Again, I want to thank our sponsors and supporters, Cengage, Rutledge, Taylor & Francis, Hauser & Work, Blick, the Bard Graduate Center, and so many others. We ask that everybody now join us for a reception in the area immediately out here. Thank you all, and have a great conference. <laughs>